right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here, all 440 and counting of you. Um, so today we have Lisa Friedman with us, a climate change reporter with the New York Times. Um, so I'll start by asking her a few questions and then we will hopefully have time for one or two audience questions as well. So feel free to put those in the chat. You can uh, direct them to questions, Ellie Sparks. Um, she will gather those um, and then I'll read out one or two um, for Lisa here in a few minutes. Um, so Lisa, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Thank you guys so much for having me. I want to apologize in advance quickly because I told my husband I was going to be on this between 2 and 2.30 and I'm absolutely sure that that is the time that he's going to choose to come in here with our next door neighbor's dog. So oh, <laughs> listen, happens, we understand. We're, we've all been living that work from home life for months <laughs> now. We're no problem at all. Um, but so I want to start by um, acknowledging that in recent months, America's attention has been absorbed and rightfully so by the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and now we're grappling with racism in our society. Um, and you've done a lot of great coverage for the Times about what the current administration has done during this time um, with environmental regulations and rolling some of those back. Um, so can you just update us on what you've been covering and what uh, rollbacks you've seen going on? and and uh, what we should be aware of in that area? Sure, absolutely. And, and let, me, let me actually work backwards for a moment and just say that, you know, when COVID-19 hit and, and, you know, everything was focused on the pandemic, I think a lot, myself, like a lot of climate reporters, were uh, sort of in limbo for, for a couple of weeks there, figuring out what this meant for our beats. Um, and from then on, we've really been focused on, you know, how do we, intersect the story of climate change with the coronavirus outbreak. And um, hopefully we are trying to do the same now with, the, with this moment in Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, we've been having a lot of conversation. I mean, a lot of our conversations with the New York Times have been very public and anyone who has Twitter has, you know, has been watched some of these play out. But internally on the climate team, we're also talking about, you know, how can we match the moment in the way that we've done with coronavirus and tell better stories about how climate change intersects with racial justice issues and, and how can we tell better uh, environmental justice stories. Um, but just to back up plenary as, you know, just to, to answer your, your direct question, you know, what I've been doing the past several months is focusing on what the administration has been doing during the coronavirus. And, um, you know, until just recently, I would, I would have said that it is too, um, not quite accurate to say that they've been rolling back regulations under the cover of coronavirus. It's been more like, uh, you know, a steady march, coronavirus be damned to roll back Obama era regulations on, on climate and, and environment. Um, but in very recent weeks, we've seen the president um, very clearly use the economic recovery as an excuse to set environmental rules by the wayside, specifically NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, and some of the rules within that law that require strict re regulation and oversight of big projects, um, you know, in the, in the name of, of uh, you know, aiding the economic recovery. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I am sure that a lot of our volunteers have, um, have seen those changes being made and have been worried about them. I mean, uh, that's, we're all here because we care very much about climate and the environment. And so that's, that's concerning to a lot of, uh, a lot of our members, I know. Um, but also in CCL, we have a pretty heavy focus on specifically on Congress and trying to get our representatives and senators to pass legislation. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the relationship between regulations and legislation and, uh, you know, as we see these, all these regulations being rolled back, what's the relationship between that and uh, Congress's responsibility to legislate? Sure. Um, and forgive me if, if some of this 50 cent tour is, you know, is, is old hat, I'm sure it is to many of you, but, you know, I'll just take you back quickly to um, 2009, which was the last time Congress was anywhere close to passing a comprehensive climate bill, the cap and trade legislation, 
passed in the House, didn't pass, didn't, you know, died in the Senate. Um, and when that failed, um, and not immediately after that failed, but, but after that failed, um, President Obama said, you know, if Congress isn't going to act, I will. And that's when we saw um, regulation after regulation come out from the EPA and Interior Department, um, most, and, and a few from, from Department of Energy, um, you know, regulating coal powered power, pardon me, regulating coal fired power plants, regulating methane emissions from oil and gas wells, um, regulating uh, um, uh, energy efficiency from appliances. And, you know, one by one, these and uh, 90 something others like them have been, have been rolled back by the Trump administration. Um, now, some of, you know, almost all of these are going to be fought in the courts. If there is a new, if there is, you know, if, if Biden wins the White House, if Democrats take the Senate, um, you know, there is, uh, well, if Biden wins the White House, many of these uh, will not be, many of these lawsuits challenging the rollbacks, you know, we may find that the, a Biden administration would no longer defend some of the rollbacks, but that doesn't necessarily mean they automatically die either. Um, so, you know, in the courts, there's a long way to go with these. Um, and, you know, to your point, Flannery, I mean, the best way to have a climate policy that is not vulnerable to the ping pong of various administrations and their priorities is to get something passed through Congress, which of course has been seemingly impossible to do for two decades. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so the other thing that is, I think, on people's minds is that this year is an election year. Um, so uh, as we saw um, last year, there was so much momentum and attention on the issue of climate change, and it seemed like a real groundswell of, of public sentiment wanting to see this problem addressed. Um, can you speak a little bit to the role of climate in the election and anything that you're seeing or noticing so far? Yeah, sure. I mean, really, I wouldn't give up hope. I mean, I know of, of you know, for, and by that I mean for folks who are, have been concerned that there hasn't been enough media coverage of climate change or attention generally in the election to climate change in the past couple months. I mean, um, I felt like the Democratic primary was different than anything I had ever seen when it comes to climate change. I mean, for as long as I've been covering this, every election cycle, I, you know, we think like, this is going to be the year that climate change actually matters. And this actually seemed to be the year that climate change really mattered. And, you know, did that mean that the candidate that many climate activists felt had the strongest plan won? No, but it also means that, you know, there are major conversations happening now within Biden's camp um, about, you know, with, with um, I mean, you've all seen the, the, the uh, presumably about the task force that was set up, uh, three chosen from Bernie Sanders campaign, including Varshini Prakash, who's uh, executive director of the Sunrise Movement, and um, it also includes AOC, um, you know, along with long-standing champions of climate action like Gina McCarthy and, and sec sec former Secretary of State John Kerry from Biden's camp working on a common platform um, and, and goals um, around climate change. Um, and what I think I'm seeing is a real effort among um, uh, former Vice President Biden's campaign and Democrats to work really hard to connect issues of climate change to issues of environmental justice in a way that I have not seen in a campaign before. So that's where I'd say, you know, is, is where I find the, the optimism in, at a moment when climate change seems like it's really not getting the attention that those of us who care about this issue want it to have. Um, you know, it is, it is not the case that it's being ignored or, or forgotten about. You know, there are, there are ebbs and flows in, in media coverage, but I think that, that this is something that remains very front of mind for, you know, at least 
at least that campaign and you know and at the New York Times we have a climate team of 15 reporters and editors um, you know and and we haven't forgotten about this issue um, and we're looking for ways you know every day to you know make sure people people remember how relevant this is and that this is you know the next threat on the horizon if not one that we're that, that's already here that we should be grappling with much better than we are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it, it's great to hear that you have a sense of that the conversation is still ongoing within the um you know, the the Biden camp and they're you know responding to the um that public sentiment that we've that we've seen and that the um that there's a sense that climate is not sort of its own uh, issue that needs to be over here in a little box. Like it does, you know, it affects jobs, it affects um, all sorts of different different issues. And so we're starting to connect the dots there. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned the New York Times uh, Climate Desk because uh, you guys do such fantastic work. Um, it, you know, your work is great, but your whole team's work is really, really fantastic. And um, and so I love, uh, we've had a couple questions come in that, that do kind of touch on um, what you mentioned that there's ebbs and flow flows and uh, media coverage on this topic. Um, have you, can you speak to what that looks like at, at the times, if there's been um, more attention on it in the, you know, in recent years or, or any, any sense that you have about other, um, other areas of the media landscape, maybe broadcast or any, you know, other areas that you um, just, sure. since you're in that world, things that you see? Sure. I mean, I am so lucky and grateful to work with an amazing team at, at the times. Um, and, you know, maybe it'll, uh, I'd love to, to, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll, I'll just tell you briefly how we work because I think it's really unique and what we're trying to do is unique. That, that we are not just a, um, you know, a team of climate change reporters separate from, you know, any, anything else at the Times. The way the Times works is um, it's, it's uh, based on desks, right? There's the, well, there's the, the masthead, the top editors, and then there's the foreign desk, the national desk, the metro desk, and climate is, I'm not sure if it's the first uh, actually, but it is one of the first and only subject area desks. And so what does that mean? What does that process stuff means? It means that, you know, my top, my editor is at, you know, the top of, of the editing bench with the national editor and the foreign editor that they are um, you know, from my level as a reporter and my colleagues, we don't have to fight for attention with, uh, you know, with the healthcare reporter and the education reporter for the attention of a national editor who's dealing with all these issues. Our editor is pitching our climate stories every day, along with every other top editor, and is also in conversations every day with all of the other editors about what they're doing, so we can also discuss you know, is there a climate angle here? Well, should, does this work best as a separate story by someone on the climate team? Or should someone from the climate team maybe send five or six smart paragraphs to explain the, the you know, how climate change dovetails with this, with this flood or, you know, um, you know, or, 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 or you know, uh, malarial outbreak. Um, and that's what we do every day. And I think, you know, that is to me really unique at the times and, um, you know, we don't always get our coverage right. We don't always prioritize the things people want us to prioritize. But I can tell you that we think really hard every day about what is the best climate coverage that we can contribute to the paper every day and make sure that this is on the front page as often as possible. And, you know, that we provide really thoughtful, in-depth stories about the impacts, about how communities are trying to adapt to climate change and, you know, the politics and the science and the business um, of dealing with climate change. Um, broadcast landscape, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I've complained about this for as long as most people, I think. And, you know, I, I will say, and maybe I'm just, I don't mean to be Pollyanna-ish, Pollyanna-ish, -ish, or whatever, I don't know what the word is. But, <laughs> I mean, as much of, as I have complained about lack of broadcast attention to climate change. I've got to say that if someone had told me a few years ago that CNN would devote seven hours 
to mostly thoughtful policy discussion of climate change? I would have thought that was crazy, but they did. And, you know, of course they, you know, they can be better and do more, but I, I see a real effort on, on the part of broadcast media as well to, um, you know, to, to, to elevate this issue. Yeah, I think that's that's my sense too, is that as, as much as we wish things would go faster and there would be more, there is definite uh, forward progress um, for sure. So um, we've gotten a couple questions about um, in the course of your reporting, um, what you're hearing from Republicans or from conservatives on climate change. And I know that last year, this was something that a lot of our volunteers noticed um, that we were uh, really seeing an uptick from elected Republicans saying, hey, we hear that, you know, that uh, members of our party want us to, to address this issue, especially young Republicans really wanted their uh, elected Republicans to come to the table. Um, and they started to figure out ways to do that. Is that something that you're still encountering in your, in your coverage? Absolutely. I mean, I, I do think that, you know, um, as soon as other issues rose, in importance, coronavirus, especially, you know, obviously, I think there was, uh, I think this very quickly was eliminated as a priority that it seemed to be for, for some Republicans, but um, maybe eliminated is too harsh. You haven't heard, we haven't heard anything much in the past couple months, which is probably to be expected. I think, you know, People who are engaged, you know, in activism on this issue will need to decide how, you know, um, how sincere the, you know, the efforts are. But what I saw and report on, reported on over the past year was, um, you know, uh, an, an effort by Republicans to find a way into this issue. Like you said, Flannery, I mean, all of the polls are showing that young voters and young Republican voters uh, acknowledge climate change, think it's a problem, want the government to do something. They might not agree with the same solutions that, um, you know, that, that their Democrat counterparts might agree with. They might, you know, there's a, uh, clearly, obviously, a, a dislike for regulation. Um, there is a, you know, very, there's a, a difference on the opinion of, of a climate, of a carbon tax. I find that seems to go over better with um, more you know, Republican, uh, you know, conservative climate activists better than conservative politicians. Um, but, um, you know, but certainly they were looking for ways to be, um, you know, to, to be working in a positive way on the issue. What you, you know, and by this, I mean, you know, they were putting forth proposals on Trillion Tree Initiative and um, and carbon capture and and storage technology. Um, I will say the one thing that you didn't see from Republicans is a willingness to to talk about a target and timetables. You know, if you if you agree if we, if you agree that climate change is something that should be dealt with, well, what's what's the goal here? And is this you know? Is this idea of investing in, um, in innovation going to get us there within the timeline we need and to the level that scientists say we need? And that's that's something that they I found they weren't really prepared to engage on yet. Um, that is that is one of the questions. Um, I think that everyone on this call is going to do their their absolute best to try to continue to push that push that forward and uh, hold some feet to the fire that yes, we need innovation, but we also need a policy that will get us there. Um, well, so we are just about at 2.20, the end of this session. Lisa, I'm so sorry we don't have more time with you, um, but no, thank, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and to everyone that's on this call, I'm going to put some links here in the chat. Um, please do check out the New York Times uh, climate coverage, and uh, you can also subscribe to the Climate Forward newsletter. Um, I put links there in the chat so that you can uh, do that. But thank you so much, Lisa. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. 
Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.